This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So hopefully you've gone through and had a look there at the objectives of financial reporting, as well as looking at the qualitative characteristics and also is it there your underlying assumption. Uh, what we're going to go through and do now is we're just going to pick things up and advance them a little bit further uh, by first of all looking at the elements of the financial statements. Because in order to go through and record the numbers, before we even think about recording the numbers, we need to ensure that we are dealing with either an asset, a liability, equity, income or expense. Um, what we need to do first of all is to ensure that we meet the definitions of what is an asset, what is a liability and so forth. So you've probably learned these from the days of F7, but I think for P2, it's a good idea to make sure that, that you commit them to memory if you've forgotten them so that you can begin to apply them in any complex scenarios that you have within an exam question. So what you've got there, if we go through and look at the, your assets, uh, an asset is, remember, something that we control. So when we went through and looked at IS17 and looked at your leases, when you looked at your leases and particularly a finance lease, we would recognise an asset under a finance lease. And the reason why, even though we didn't legally own it, in substance, we owned it because what we had there is we had control, didn't we? We had control over that asset for a fixed period of time, i.e. the lease period. So as we had control, as a result of a past event, that the signing of the, the lease agreement, and they would generate an inflow of economic benefits, then we were able to recognise an asset. But that then just brings into question, doesn't it? If you're like, what about an operating lease? Surely with an operating lease still, we should be recognising an asset. Because under an operating lease, we don't recognise an asset, do we? Under an operating lease, we don't have the risks and rewards of ownership. So all we do is we just recognise an expense straight line through profit or loss, isn't it? Sounds about correct, doesn't it? But even though it's just a short term lease, which just tends to be what happens with an operating lease. We still control the asset, don't we? OK, so uh, when we begin to look at your assets, one of the key aspects to consider is control. And that's one of the issues that you have with regards to IS 17 and leases is that we have control of that asset. OK, it may be for six months, 12 months, 18 months. But because we don't have the substantial risks and rewards of ownership, we don't recognise it. But, but but we meet that definition of an asset. So maybe we need to go through and update IS17, which is what's currently in process, isn't it? And IFRS16 has been published and will be adopted uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so it's important that you know the definition in terms of your assets. Likewise, in terms of your liabilities, uh, a liability is that you have a present obligation as a result of a past event that gives you an outflow of economic benefits. And again, the key aspect there is a present obligation. If you, again, you tie it back into leases, tie it into your operating lease, you just show an expense through profit or loss. You've signed a lease contract, haven't we, that says you are going to pay X amount every month. Surely that is an obligation, isn't it? But we don't show a liability. So our current standard on leases is at the moment currently flawed, isn't it? And why? Because it doesn't meet these definitions of the elements that you have within the framework. And that's therefore why we have decided to adopt a new approach and come up with IFRS 16. OK, so it's very useful when you're thinking about accounting standards to see whether or not they meet the definitions of the elements within the framework. Again, another one that you have there is your equity. Your equity is a residual interest in your assets, less liabilities, and that's all that you have with regards to your equity. Uh, so you take your assets, you deduct your liabilities, and the residual, what's left, is referred to as equity. I always thought equity was to do with ownership, wasn't it? You know, if, if you own equity shares, you own part of that business. So so here it, it doesn't mention anything it, it, with regards to ownership, does it, of the business? And when you talk about ownership, if you have a particular level of ownership, that can then give you control, doesn't it? And if you have control, then, then you can start preparing group accounts. And, and nothing here within equity mentions that whatsoever. So again, maybe we need to adopt a different approach to, to how we go through there and classify equity with regards to maybe ownership and 
and non-ownership equity interest. Okay, uh, but for the time being, it's just your assets less your liability. It's just a residual of what's left within the business after you've settled all of your liabilities. Okay, which, if you like, it is what the shareholders then own, isn't it? But you know that they own a bit more than that, don't they? They own all of those assets. But there we go. This is the issues that you have with. If you like that, the current standards, as great as they are, they're not perfect. Okay. Uh, if you think about income, if you think about expenses, uh, we're, we're obviously they're thinking more about profit or loss. Uh, income is quite simply an increase in asset. Uh, so if you think about a credit sale, you debit your receivables, you credit your sales, don't you? you know, that increase in the asset has led to an increase in income. But don't forget as well, uh, if you reduce your liabilities, uh, then therefore, again, that essentially can be interpreted as income, isn't it? Think about deferred income. That's that credit balance, isn't it, on the statement of financial position. If you reduce your deferred income balance, you are debiting your deferred income and crediting profit or loss, i.e. you're crediting it with the income that should be recognised for this period based upon that accruals concept, wasn't it, that, that we mentioned in that previous video. Uh, likewise, if you think about it then uh, as an expense, uh, an expense is a reduction in your assets or an increase in your liability. Uh, so if you go through and pay your cash uh, to pay an invoice, you credit your bank and you debit your expense, don't you? That reduction in asset is therefore an, an increase in your expense. Uh, if you accrue interest on a loan, then you are increasing your liability. And the other side there, again, uh, it is therefore an interest expense, isn't it? So that increase in liability is an increase in your expense you probably never thought about things such as income and expenses in that fashion there but essentially that is what it is okay uh just be aware particularly when you get to the world is it of your intangibles and beginning to look at your recognition uh transactions may meet the definitions of assets and liabilities but maybe we do not recognize them in order to physically show the asset, the liability, the income, the expense, or even the equity within the financial statements. Not only does it need to meet the definition of that element, it also needs to meet the recognition criteria, isn't it? Uh, and that recognition criteria, yes, you're shouting it at me already, is that you need probable future economic benefits. So there needs to be more likely than not that there will be an inflow or an outflow of economic benefits to or from the entity. And the most obvious one as well, it is that you can measure it reliably. You can assess um, a valid number and that can be, if you like, faithfully represented, uh, if you like as well, that can be verifiable. Uh, and then you can record that amount within the financial statements, can't we? OK, uh, so when we think about intangibles, something may meet the definition of an asset, but if it cannot be measured reliably, uh, such as brand names, such as internally generated goodwill, then, then it cannot be recognised, can it? Okay. Uh, likewise, if you're thinking about probable future economic benefits, you're, you're going back, aren't you, to looking at a provision. Uh, you can only recognise a provision if there is a probable outflow of economic benefit. If it is only possible, then there is no provision and we just disclose a contingent liability, don't we? Okay. Uh, then we talk about the, the measurements. Uh, so when you're thinking about reliable measurement, how can we go through and measure those figures? Uh, well, the, the most common ones that you have there essentially are, if you like, your historical cost. When we think about property, plant and equipment, you, you, you capitalise the asset at the amounts paid plus your directly attributable cost. So that is therefore then at your historical cost, isn't it? Uh, likewise, if you think about your inventory, uh, you look at the lower of cost, so your historical cost and, and net realisable value. So one of the other measurement bases is going through there as well and thinking about your realisable value. So what you could potentially sell it for. And if your realisable value on inventory is lower than your historic cost, then you measure it at the lower value because that brings about the accounting concept of oh, prudence. Well, that, there's a new one, isn't it? You know, we, we, we talk about prudence a lot, but prudence isn't actually physically mentioned within the framework even though we, we are encouraged to be prudent there, there is no qualitative characteristic is there that, that talks about prudence maybe the framework could be updated then couldn't it we, we could incorporate prudence within our fundamental principles couldn't we 
and, and have that as a basis of preparation of our financial statements. But again, that's something we can go through there and think about in the future when we get to current issues, isn't it? The fact that prudence is not contained uh, as one of the characteristics or as well an, an, an assumption within the framework. OK, uh, other ones to consider as well are looking there at your current cost. So instead of looking at things from a historical cost perspective, what would it go through and cost you in up to date monetary terms? OK, so we could adjust for that current cost, but tends not to happen so much within the world of financial reporting, does it? Uh, we tend to use our historical cost because that is more verifiable, isn't it? OK, uh, and then you could also go through then think about your present value, couldn't you? Uh, if you think about a provision and a provision for decommissioning costs that you have that may be related to property, plants and equipment and decommissioning that PP at the end of its useful life. Again, you recognise a provision, but you recognise it at its present value, don't we? And the reason why we recognise it at its present value is because if it is materially different, so going back to it being relevant as part of your fundamental qualitative characteristics, if it is materially different to its value in the future, then you recognise it at its present value because that is more relevant, isn't it? And then you can go through there and unwind the discount uh, up to its terminal value, can't you? OK, so all of the things that you've seen previously and, and what you will see into the future can all be tied back in some way, shape or form to what you see within this framework that provides the underlying principles and concepts. Uh, the last bit of the framework, a little bit of a funny aspect, uh, is talking about capital maintenance. Uh, so capital is essentially your, your, your money that's invested within the business. And it's saying there that is that money invested within the business maintained every year? Because you would want it to be maintained, wouldn't you? You want it to be improved. That's what we're talking about with regards to maintenance. Yeah, the more capital that you generate, uh, the more profitability you make ultimately. Therefore, the more cash you will have within the business and the more cash you have within the business, the more dividend you are going to receive. And if you receive more dividend, you become more wealthy, don't we? OK, so this is saying, look, if you've made a profit, are you actually maintaining capital? OK, are, are you actually becoming more wealthy? as a shareholder. Ultimately, you should be, but there's just different ways of thinking around that wealth that you are creating. You have what's first of all thought of as your financial capital maintenance and then a theoretical thought process of your operating or physical capital maintenance. So capital is maintained. You, you generate a profit, don't you? If, if you're closing net assets, are greater than your opening net assets. Because if that's the case, the reason why is that you have made a profit, isn't it? And financial capital maintenance starts looking at maintaining that capital from an invested and a return, if you like, perspective. You've invested capital within the business and your closing net assets are more than your opening. You have made a profit and therefore your financial capital has increased. So you have essentially made more money. That, that's, however, ignoring the effects of inflation. Uh, but the effects of inflation every single year should should be minimal, shouldn't they? You know, so therefore, they are not relevant. So we're not going to go through there and take account of that inflation because it's not relevant. It's not material on an annual basis. Clearly, over a longer period of time, then that would have more relevance. But people tend not to compare financial statements over a longer period of time than, than, than a year up, up to five years. And hopefully inflation wouldn't be too important. If it was, if we operated in a hyperinflationary economy, then yes, we would go through and make adjustments so that we get a, a fairer presented picture of your financial capital maintenance. OK, uh, so financial is thinking about it from maintaining your capital on an investment and a return basis. So thinking purely from financial perspectives. OK, have you made more profit, ignoring any effects of inflation? OK, the operating one is a highly fictitious, theoretical way of thinking about maintaining capital. And it begins to think more, if you like, about inflation. Because if you've generated a profit and you've got more capital, you, you, you've got more money to invest. The, the issue that you've got there is that the price of your inventory, that the, the, what you buy to operate your business, whatever price that was at the start of the year, 
then inflation will have increased the value of that inventory to a higher amount via inflation, won't it? So even though you have increased your capital and increased the profitability within your business, if you look at it from a purely physical or operating capacity, you may not be able to buy the same amount of goods at the end of the year than what you were able to buy at the start of the year because those goods at the end of the year are now more expensive. And because of that, therefore, your capital has not been maintained to the levels that you previously were able to incorporate at the start of the year. So what we could go through and do there is we could start maybe to update the information to, to try and incorporate some form of maintenance from a, from a physical or an operating capacity to try and reflect, if you like, the more up to date prices of inventory and what you are now able to afford compared to what you were able to afford at the start of the year. But as I said, that's theoretical. It's just a thought process. The fact that at the end of the year, we may not be able to buy as much as what we were able to buy at the start of the year because of inflation. So therefore, maybe we could incorporate a bit of inflation, incorporate, if you like, current values into our accounting process to get a better reflection of your physical or your operating capital maintenance. You may get three or four marks thrown in somewhere within the exam on a very, very rare occasion. I can't recall it being seen anywhere previously. Uh, however, just have an idea of those concepts of capital maintenance. Financial is thinking about it from an investment and a return perspective, how much you are generating uh, and ignores, if you like, inflation. But then you can think about your operating capital maintenance and what you can physically purchase and that you can physically purchase less than what you could at the start of the year due to inflation. So maybe it will be better to prepare the financial statements, maybe on your more up to date current cost measurement to show, if you like, your, your capital being maintained from a physical or operating capacity. OK, please don't get too bogged down within it. it it's not hugely important. It's just a concept. It's just an idea. And as I said, it, it's just a thought process, isn't it? OK, if you're thinking about updates to current accounting standards, it is not going to go through and think about things in a capital maintenance perspective. OK, it's going to think about your measurement, your recognition, your elements and your qualitative characteristics. They're the four things that you really need to understand and observe as you go through any exam question. OK. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because I think I've probably gone through and spent too long already. Uh, it is an exercise that I would encourage you to have a go through and look at yourself. Uh, it says apply the principles outlined in the framework. So when you're thinking about your principles, it's any of the above regard or excluding your capital maintenance. So we're thinking about the elements, assets, liabilities uh, and the others, income, expense and equity. Uh, we're thinking about the recognition, we're thinking about measurements, because that is what is contained, isn't it, within the ISB framework. OK, uh, so you've got four there, inventories, PPE, provisions, intangibles. I think I've mentioned each one of them as we've gone along. So what I would like you to go through and do instead of me going through and working the example, I really want to, to get you to start thinking under your own steam. OK, I'll help you to start off with, you know, so if we're thinking there, aren't we about, say. Inventory. Inventory is there, isn't it, as I guess, too. Now, what I want you to go through and do is can you tie in inventory to, to, to some of the principles within the, the framework? So, you know, if you think about the. The elements, what, what, which of the elements is inventory? It's an asset, isn't it? So you need to go through there and, and tell me uh, why it is an asset. OK, uh, inventory is an asset because it is a resource that we control as a result of a past event, which gives rise to an inflow of economic benefits. When we sell it, we will make a profit. Won't it? I'm already saying too much, uh, but, but you get the idea. If you go through there and think about your. Your recognition. 
Okay, you know, there, there were two points, weren't there? Again, I, I'm going too far, but there we go. That's the way these things tend to work. Uh, recognition, you're thinking, weren't we? About probable. And also there wasn't it that we go through. And measure reliably. So is there a probable inflow of economic benefit? Is it more likely than not that you'll be able to sell that inventory and generate profit? Yes. Uh, can you measure the cost reliably? Well, yeah, we, we, we've got an invoice that, that shows us the amount that we paid for that inventory, doesn't it? And then we can go through as well. And think about the measurement. What measurement principles do we go through and use uh, as part of uh, the valuation of inventory? What, what was the rules? Yeah, it was the lower of cost and NRV. I'm going to stop there. Okay, And you'll be able to tie that back into the the measurement element, if you like, of the framework. Okay, uh, so there we go. That I want you to do that in terms of inventory. I want you to do that in terms of was it PPE provisions and intangibles. You could also go through as well if you like and think about the qualitative characteristics. You don't have to write anything down. I would just like you maybe to, to scribble down notes, turn it into a thought process to go through there and help you understand how we take the principles from the framework and apply it to a particular accounting standard, because that's going to be very, very important as you work your way through the standards, okay? as you work your way through group accounts. Because if something that crops up within the exam is quite complex and quite technically challenging, then you can always go back to the framework to help you with your understanding. And when you're trying to answer that current issues question, the framework is so ridiculously useful to help you answer any current issues, questions. The more work you do here, the easier things will become in the long run. Other than that, once you've worked it through for those four accounting standards, have a flip to the answer at the back. Have a work through. If there's any questions, feel free to throw the matters on the forum. We're always there to go through and help you on the P2 Ask a Tutor forum. Uh, fear not, I'm not going to go through with every example. Uh, within the notes and get you to do them. Uh, I'll try and involve you as much as possible. Most of the time, I will be doing the examples myself uh, to help you through them. But I do feel that, that with this example here, it's important to get you thinking about the framework and applying it without me doing the work for you, because that will then help you immeasurably as we go forward. Other than that, that that's it in terms of this first chapter. Uh, in the end, it probably was quite interesting, wasn't it? Okay, Taking the knowledge that you have from F7 and F3 and beginning to apply that with regards to those rules and principles. Other than that, I'll see you for the next chapter. Uh, it's only very short. It won't take too long. And then we can move on to the next. Other than that, I'll see you in the next chapter. Take care. Goodbye.